Hey guys, thanks for joining everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Ranella. I'm the author most recently of Outdoor Kids in an Inside World. And uh, we're here to talk about that book tonight, answer questions. We got a bazillion questions from um, listeners. I'm, uh, if you're wondering, I'm in, if you're listening to the Meat Eater podcast, I'm in our podcast studio right now. And you'll notice, let me grab this real quick, uh, in the top of the book, you'll see the dedication um this to my wife it says we're with that ah, sorry it says for katie without you there'd be nothing and it just so happens that i had i needed a moderator tonight and so my very own wife katie's gonna moderate tonight but she doesn't uh she does she's not like a uh she doesn't dig the public scene too much so she's off she's off over there but she'll say hi to y'all hey everybody um You'll hear she's going to do that. She's going to select the questions that we're going to cover and do the questions. And there's a million of them. So I kind of want to get to the questions sooner than later. But I'll talk a little bit about the book. Um, the reason I'd rather do questions than, than talk about the book is if you ever write a book and you do a lot of media for it, you you do these like really quick hit media things, you know, that are like five minute interviews and the questions seem to be the same. And so you wind up getting a little bit sick of hearing yourself say the same things in very short amounts of time but i'll what i would say about this book and i, I actually talk about this in the book that this is a book i thought i would never in a million years write um as a writer like before i had kids and, and i don't know if there's many people out there listening right now that don't have kids before i had kids i'd always be annoyed by people who had kids and then they would switch to being that all they thought about was kids i never understood it um especially annoyed me with writers you know who'd start writing about their kids because i'm like well, what happened to all the, the shit you used to be interested in you're not interested in that anymore now you're interested in your kids but now i get it um having kids is a is a it's a journey um it's very rewarding it's it feels impossible at times uh for me, it became easier, though, to do this book because it was like I've, in my career with, with the show I do, the podcast I do, the books I write, I feel like I've always explored if I was going to kind of sum it up. Right. You know, I, I read about hunting and fishing the outdoors. But if I was going to sum it up, I would say I, I explore like human relationships to nature. And by doing a book about raising outdoor kids, I wasn't leaving my subject matter because it, it, it's about human relationships to nature. But in this case, it's about kids humans kids are humans they don't seem like it sometimes but they're humans so those humans relationship to nature um and so it very much fit with what i do i, I was joking the other day like i i have you, you know right most writers have an agent what an agent does is an agent is uh like an, an agent's a go-between between a writer or you know it could be an actor a comedian or whatever and and sort of the money right so my book is published by Random House. Um, all my books have been published by Random House. So your agent is the one that sort of the go between and brokers a deal between you, the writer, and the publisher. In my case, Random House. That's what an agent does. I've had the same agent for a million years. Twenty, man, probably. Let me think. Twenty years. Yeah, I've had the same agent for twenty years. A guy named Mark Gerald, um, dear friend of mine as well. When my wife was pregnant with her first kid and right now may 9 is our our oldest boy's birthday when she was pregnant with him 12 years and nine months ago roughly my agent was already like discussing with me he's like someday he thought it should be soon back then someday soon you should write a book about like what it's going to be like when you have kids because you like to spend all your time outside and, and you hunt fish and roam around and that means so much to you like what are you going to do when you have kids are you going to give up are you going to make them go like how will you balance all this like how will you give them what you had or introduce them to what you love and we mused about it a lot and uh i started more seriously thinking about it when my boy was five we have three kids now when my oldest boy was five i started seriously thinking about it but i felt like well who am i Right, I haven't logged the hours yet, but now that he's 12 and we have two more behind him, I feel like I, uh, um, I'm not a perfect dad, not a perfect husband, like by far, by, like I'm way far away from the perfect dad. I'm way far away from the perfect husband. 
but I have developed what I would call subject matter expertise on what it's like to have kids outside, like what it's like to try to get kids outside. Like I've been doing it for a long time now. Right. And, and I know what I'm talking about when I talk about the ways in which it's hard or things that work. I'm, I'm there on that. Uh, that that kind of subject matter expertise, I think, is important when you're working on something. When, when I was working on my Buffalo book, which is kind of my, one of my favorite books that I've done, American Buffalo. Uh, I worked on it for two years. I spent a year just traveling and researching. Right. A little more than a year, actually. And I got, when I started to write the book, like I composed the book in about eight months. When I started to write the book in that moment, I, I, I was pretty firmly convinced that I knew more about that subject than anyone alive on the planet. That's going to sound like a bold ass thing to say. So I want to clarify, like, I didn't know more about physiology. I didn't know more about history. I didn't know more about hunting. I didn't know more about on and on and on. But the whole collective thing, like like all of that stuff, right? I knew if you added up all the bits of information I knew about all the kinds of shit I talked about in that book, like I knew more about it than anybody else. There's experts that knew more about their area, like their particular piece, way more about their piece than I knew. But like all the pieces together, I had it dialed. I don't anymore, but I did when I wrote the book. And, and um, after living this kid thing for so long, um, I got, you know, I, I don't feel like a phony to, to to do the things I'm doing and to have done the book that I've done. And I'm, and I'm quite proud of it. Uh, so I guess that's going to suffice as a way of an introduction. And we're going to dive in. My wife's going to pick questions. And I think there's also questions are going to pop up. She's already got a ton of questions with people's names on them. So we're going to roll into the questions now. So Anthony from Rome, Maine, mm -hmm. he asked, how much non-life-threatening suffering should you let your kids go through outdoors? Being uncomfortable is part of the game sometimes, but I don't want them to hate going out next time. Man, that's a good question. Um, I struggle with it. I don't think my dad struggled with it, and it blows my mind that he didn't burn us out. Um, I'll talk a little bit first. First, I'll answer the, I'm just going to flat out answer the question. Like, how, like, remember we're saying non-life threatening. How much non-life threatening? I don't think there's a limit. I, like, I really don't think there's a limit. If it's non-life threatening, I don't, I wouldn't worry about the how much. It would kind of depend on the kid's temperament. You have to sort of be reading them. Um, my dad was like, didn't pay attention to that junk at all. Uh, I so many, I froze my fingers and toes, like, like damaged them so many times. And I was little, they're, they're messed up now. Like they, they, I damaged the nerves and my fingertips. I was freezing them when I was a little kid, ice fishing. Uh, I don't know, man. I feel like he was almost a little bit, he, he was more, he was more bold about it than I am. Like he would put me through things that I'd be on, that I would be nervous about putting my kids through this morning, just this morning, I was turkey hunting with my boy on his birthday and it was raining and it was I don't know, about 37 degrees, kind of like raining and wet snow. Um, it actually snowed a bunch and ended up snowing a bunch, but it was raining and wet snow and he was fidgeting too much because he was cold and I was getting annoyed with him. So I pulled him up in my lap. And we're sitting there calling and I have him in my lap. And he's kind of doing this weird breathing thing, which I thought was meant to sort of like exaggerate how cold he was. And I got a little annoyed with him. Um, and I just made him sit there for a long time. We sat there for an hour being cold. And uh on one hand, he'd be like, well, was I doing that because I wanted him to suffer? Or I was doing it because I wanted us to get a turkey. And we've been working pretty hard. He put a lot of time in the spring trying to get a turkey. I wanted him to get a turkey. Because if he did, right, it made it would make all of that walking and being cold, it would make all that so valuable in his mind. He'd be like, that's what it takes to achieve that. So that's the thing I run into often is I'm like, you want them to experience success. You want them to experience what comes from trial and tribulation. You want them to see like expertise play out and be rewarded. 
if you quit every time something comes up, right? Every time someone's tired, every time someone's thirsty, every time someone's hungry, every time someone's cold or they're hot or the bugs, if you quit every time that stuff comes up, they'll they they won't experience the, the they won't experience the journey that, that that becomes like setting your mind to something, overcoming obstacles to get there, and then having success, which I'll point out is like what makes a story a story is a person wants something there are things you know a, a, a human or animal or something wants something there are things trying to block them from getting it right a story is you trying to overcome the obstacles successfully or not that's what a story is i want them to live the story of the outdoors so if i felt like i was i say all that and i'll, I'll conclude by saying if I really felt strongly, let's say I knew that we were approaching burnout, meaning it was so bad that I wasn't going to be able to get them back out for a few months, um, I would let up. But I guess I try to walk the line as tightly as I can walk it. Um, but I wouldn't want to push it. But I think they can hack more than you think they can. My kid, all his weird, like, this and that breathing stuff. The minute we got up, he's like back to fine. You know, it was, it was, as I suspected, a bit of a show. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Gregory from surprise, Arizona wants to know what is your kid's favorite game meat and how did you prepare it when you first served it to them? Um, I, I'll tell you in a minute. Because I don't like if I tell you like I'm always afraid I'm going to tell people this and they're going to think that that I'm like th picking something really cool to make my kids seem cool. Um, I'll say that you can it really by how you sell something I think you can generate a lot of interest, right? Um, like if there's a story behind something, right? You can you can make kids like it. Uh, the thing my kids like most that's obvious, right, is fried fish. So. I grew up in a real fish frying culture in the Midwest, um, like Friday night fish fries. If I said to you, it's a Friday night fish fry and you live in where I, in Michigan when I, at the time I was growing up, like, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Very common deep fried fish. And we fished for fish fry fish. We fished like a lot of freshwater, white fleshed fish that were good fried. Well, that's kind of the main things we targeted. Uh, so I had a lot of fondness for that meal. We used to eat a lot of fried fish. My kids love fried fish. Um, they like it because all kids like fried fish. It's like a French fry potato, but it's made out of fish. They, they love them. Uh, so that one's kind of obvious. When I was a kid, though, we would, when we got it deer, especially if we got a deer in the morning, we would come home and in the late morning, my old man would cut the heart, like kind of like from the pointed end back and cut it in basically probably like three sixteenths to a quarter inch thick slices. And he'd put salt and pepper on them. Um, my mom did most of the cooking, but he'd put salt and pepper on them and and get oil in a pan and, and and dust the heart pieces in flour and cook it. And uh, I really loved it. Uh, I don't know if this is true. My parent, my mom thought I had iron poor blood when I was a kid. I don't know. I've never, that's never shown up since then, but it was a thing that she talked about all the time. So I ate a lot of, they would give me a lot of heart, and liver and stuff like that when I was little. But I really grew up liking that that heart meal. So when my when my, my boy got his first deer, I only have one that's old enough to hunt. Um, when he got his first deer, we, I like introduced this to him, like this is a thing, you know. And I did it when I was a kid, so he really likes that meal. Um, but there's a lot of build up to it. He also likes to hunt. Like uh, we have an they're all over the place. We have an animal called pine squirrel. It's like a non game animal. There no bag limit, no close season. No one hunts for him. He likes to hunt those, but I'm like, if you're going to shoot it, you're going to eat it. So he likes to just fry it in a pan and he'll, he likes it because he wants to go get more pine squirrels. So I don't know if he likes it or just knows he has to do it to get more pine squirrels, but um, they like all that stuff. But, but far and away, man, uh, if you want to get kids like started on a wild game, get a deep fried fish. This is a related question. Matt from Omaha said, are any of your kids picky eaters? And what's the best means of nudging your children to be food, food curious? My kids are picky about stuff, but if I was going to rate them during the 
th- they're picky and annoying about some things, but like compared to other kids I'm exposed to, they're way better than they're, they're yeah they're among the they're definitely among not the but among the least pickiest eaters i know every question with kids comes down to like nurture or nature right there's sort of like you know there's you, you have your like genetics your predispositions and then you have your influences around you we never my wife and i we never got into that bs of uh where you make them a separate dinner. I can't stand when people do that, where you're like, we're having this, but the kids are having noodles. Never got into that. We do like polite bite, okay? No matter what it is, you gotta try it. You can't condemn it without trying it. We do a lot of clean plate club stuff. Um, We cook, we eat like a variety of things every night. Everybody has to try it. You generally are, Like we like, I don't know, it sounds bad. We force them to eat their stuff. And it's paid off over time because they're, for the most part, they'll sit and eat what you put in front of them. Now and then you can tell. If you give my daughter a fried egg, man, she legitimately gags. So we we make her eat a fried egg maybe every like three months, four months, just to see if it still happens. Um, I try not to be cruel with them, but we don't entertain a lot of BS. Like if they legitimately hate something, we'll let them slide. And I remember it's funny because speaking of liver and heart and all that, I remember one night I had made deer liver and it was awful. Like I even thought it was bad, but I wasn't letting on how bad it was. Like livers are very, highly variable. Deer livers are. One's good. One's horrible. This one was horrible. And I was making my daughter eat it. And she's almost in tears about it. And then Katie here takes a bite of the liver and broke our rule. Because she then turns to my daughter and says, Rosemary, you do not have to eat that. That was gross. And so, yeah, they get a slide. They get a, they get to walk now. Now, for the most part, we just don't we don't put up with it. We're just we get too annoyed well, by it. Matt and salad. Oh, our little boy <laughs> hates salad more than anybody on the planet. That's true. We still make him eat salad every night to some degree. Like every night, he eats some salad. And one time, he was defining. Uh, he was trying to think of like what is the difference between an adult and a kid. And sort of in his mind, the defining characteristic of adults and kids is adults like salad. <laughs> and he, yeah, that was all you needed to know. Oh, we just lost it. Oh, shoot. Sorry. How embarrassing. Oh, sorry. Getting a phone call. My mother in law. <laughs> uh, all right. What's the next question? Okay. Um, Peyton from Chesapeake, Virginia. Said, what is the best way to ease your spouse into the idea of kids hunting? What age is appropriate to start taking them? I didn't. I never had to ease my spouse into it. Um, that's just why you know. Even when we met, I was. That's what I was doing all. I was not all the time. I mean, a lot. Right. It was kind of like the the thing. Right. The outside of work was like the thing I was interested in. There was never. I never allowed there be any doubt about what was going to be going on. Um, when we found out that our second kid, when we found out that she was going to not going to be a girl was a girl uh right away my wife said to me um you're not going to treat her different than our boy like that's not going to work it's not going to be that like she's excluded from all this and we were on the same page about that uh that wasn't going to happen um age stuff a lot of states now that used to have restrictions don't anymore so i was brought up in michigan and it was ridiculous at the time when i was a kid you could start bow hunting at 12 and you couldn't hunt deer with a gun till you were 14 which i think is stupid um i don't know what the right age is necessarily what a law like what the law should say but shouldn't say that that's ridiculous uh should be much younger than that michigan since got rid of the whole thing right now your kids with like their mentor okay so the dad uncle mom whatever a designated person who's a licensed hunter in good standing i think 25 years old whatever the hell it is there's some parameters around who's a mentor as long as they're like within arm's reach or earshot or however they define it immediate control they can hunt any age you want that to me feels like the best answer would be like it's a family it's a family issue it's up to the family. In, in fact, when I was a kid and they had those rules, my dad ignored the rules anyways. He was just, he did, he was totally uninterested in what they thought, that what the state felt should happen there. But I'll, I'll go on and say this. Um, 
I live in Montana. In Montana, they have to be 12 to hunt on their own. Okay, so so a 12 year old could take a deer and head off by himself out in the woods. At 10, they can hunt with their mentor. So here's a rule, and I just said, like, I don't like the rules, but if you're gonna have a rule, that's a great rule. I think the 10 um didn't feel too late to me, it didn't feel too early. Keep in mind too that we have three kids staggered, okay? So um i was bringing my older boy with me before he was old enough now my daughter gets to come and watch her older brother hunt she's that's training her and she's excited about when she gets to get a deer uh so we're doing it all the time you know but that that feels like a great age if our state didn't have an age requirement i probably would have done it maybe a year earlier probably not two years earlier not for big game so for me around eight, nine, 10 feels great. I don't think there's, but I really don't, it just kind of be, comes down to like how well they're going to comprehend the experience. You know, are they going to comprehend the experience? Like what are the, what's their understanding of it? I don't want to condemn it off and see pictures where some, you know, you'd be like, Oh, my four-year-old got a deer. I mean, yeah, that's great. I don't know what kind of trip a four-year-old's on, but I don't know how well they're really logging and understanding what it is that they're engaged in. I'm again, not condemning it. It's just that, um, I want them to get at it early enough where it doesn't surprise them. Uh, my kids are not surprised by animal death. It, it doesn't, I don't want to say it doesn't bother them. It doesn't surprise them. It doesn't shock them, which is great. And I'm, I'm glad we did it the way we did it. So Derek from Kansas city, I, I realize you just sort of answered this question, but he said, my son is six and loves watching meat eater. What, mm -hmm. what do you think is the best age for a kid to start hunting? So we hear that a lot, that a lot of little kids like to watch yeah. meat eater. So does that factor into your answer there? No, no, that doesn't change. I get, you know, like I said, bring them like we were, I, I would bring my kids out doing stuff before they, before they could walk. It's just, I guess what I say, like start hunting. I'm guessing they're meaning like, like using the weapon, you know? Um, and, and again, you got other factors like, like a, a very dear friend of mine. He's having a hard time where he keeps trying to get his daughter to, for turkey hunting. She doesn't like the recoil. Right. And he's and he's waiting for her to enjoy shooting. Um, she has the desire, but doesn't like the noise and doesn't like the recoil. Um, and that's like become their issue. If he pushed that and pushed her into a bad experience, she might just tune it out. So, uh, and she's right in that age we're talking about. Bring them like the minute you can put them in a backpack, take them. But be a little bit, you know, think about what you're doing when it comes to them using you know, shooting the guns and just that they comprehend what's going on, that they, that they, that they understand what they're doing. Right. And, and then safety stuff, I'm not even going to get into. I explain all this in the book, by the way. It's like the, all my thoughts on this are in the book. So um, that actually leads into Zachary's question from Wentzville, Missouri. He said, thoughts on building an AR platform rifle for youth deer hunting in Missouri youth. In Missouri, youth can harvest an animal starting at seven. I want to utilize a firearm that has less recoil, can grow with the kids, and is ethical to the animal. I don't have experience building one for kids. I have an AR of my own that was custom made for me. Um, I'm left-handed. You know, obviously it jacks on the right, but you know it's got safety both sides. I haven't made one for my kids. The two things I've done for like, I'll tell real quick what I use for my kids for stuff uh start them out so at 10 well i take that back it's my daughter how old's rosie right now are you serious no listen my daughter killed her first turkey when she was eight years old how old is she now nine okay my daughter killed her first turkey when she was eight here's how she killed her first turkey with we had a break open 410 with a red dot sight okay very simple it's like very like cock the hammer I can, I can look at the gun and tell what's going on with it, right? I can see the hammer's cocked or not cocked, so I know about safety. Uh, it's got a red dot. I'm like, put that red dot on that turkey's head, pull the trigger. Um, and she's killed two turkeys with the 410. Uh, I have a 6.5 Creed for, for big moving on to big game. So a small game, obviously, we use 22s. Um, uh, for big game, I have a like a woman's – Weatherby makes a rifle, the Camilla, I think it is. It's like a woman's cut, like a woman's size bolt gun. 
my boys killed a few, couple deer with that uh, in 6.5 Creedmoor. So a right-handed woman's gun. Um, now, when you want to talk about like a thing that can grow with the kid, I've been messing around um, for my boy, and I'll have my daughter shoot it too, is we have a SIG cross in 6.5 Creedmoor that the kids are shooting. They, they like the thing. My kid just likes the way it looks, right? He likes that. But it's got an adjustable stock. It's very, I'm not, I'm not talking you got to go into your shop and start like taking it apart and adding shims. This stock is like adjustable. Like I can make it for me or I can make it for my daughter. It's threaded for a suppressor. We're allowed to hunt with suppressors. Um, so you can put a suppressor on there. We got a good, we got a little bastard muzzle brake for it to put on there. Um, I put a, so it's got M locks along the rail. It's like an AR. And we're able to put a, a arc rail on the M lock on the bottom of the, the four piece forearm. You can lock that into a tripod, right? It's a great gun. Um, it's a great kid's gun. I like them to shoot 22s just to, just to shoot cans and shoot. But when, you, when you're getting them dialed on like big game, I like to like rule out as many questions as possible. Like when it comes to actually shooting, right? And I like to be able to lock that thing into a tripod for him um, and shoot. And he's on, on that rig, he's gotten some pigs and some other stuff. It, it's a great rig. But I have not built a... Uh, I haven't built something in the AR platform for the kids. If I did, though, I think that I think that um, a 243, 65, those are great beginner rounds for kids. Don't go so light. Don't get so crazy with going light caliber that you put them into a bad situation of getting a hit on something that's not that's not lethal. Like you can't, you know, you, you like like don't go into it thinking they're gonna like shoot the heart out of something, right? They might, but they also might not. And so have enough. There's an, you need enough ass on that gun that if things are a little squirrely, you, you're still going to get a lethal hit. Uh, Cody from North Manchester, Indiana says, how do you balance family and the outdoors? I have four kids and a wife and I find it hard to get out. I include them as much as possible. Still seems like I need more time in the day. Uh, you're not going to get over that feeling. You're definitely going to need more time in the day. Uh, I'm really not the guy that, I mean, like I have thoughts on it because I have a lot of friends. I've, I've grown up with a lot of people that have kids. Like we have these conversations all the time. So I have thoughts on it, but I wouldn't really like look to me particular to help answer that because that's such an unusual shit, unusual situation where um, my, my work, like the work I do. So what it's like podcast or writing the show I do, the, the work I do is where I'm like sort of interpreting um, outdoor experiences, right? Like people will be like, oh, you hunt for a living. I'm like, no, I don't. I, like, I don't really feel it's kind of semantics almost. I don't feel that I hunt for a living or I fish or whatever for a living. I feel like I do those things because those things are my passion. What I do for a living is I make material about it, right? I generate, like I produce content. I produce media about my experiences. The experiences I would be having, like I would go have those experiences no matter what. What I wouldn't do is I wouldn't turn them into books and shows. So I make books and shows for a living. But that relationship allows me to, to, to spend an, an, an inordinate, an inordinate, I can't say that word. What's the word? Inordinate. An inordinate, damn, that's a tough one, amount of time outdoors. Uh, if I wasn't doing what I do and I was just living a life that some of my friends live where they're outdoorsmen with kids, um, I would, I would strike a balance and, and still probably spend some time by myself, not because I wanted to be by myself because I needed to, because I would feel compelled to go have success because we like to eat wild game in our house. So that'd be like the thing on my mind. Right. Um, is I'd want to go get a handful of deer every year and, and other stuff, like enough stuff to eat all year. And if I felt that I wasn't going to get to that threshold with my kids, I would go do it. Like I'd find the most efficient way possible and I would go shoot enough stuff for us to eat. And then I'd spend all my other time with my kids. Let's say I was a catch and release angler and you're not doing it for food. And this is probably going to piss off some people. 
if I was a, just like a catch and release trout fisherman, I would always, always have my kids with me. I can't picture that as much as they could go out and have them go because it's like, who cares? Like you're going to like let a few less fish go. It's like, who cares? It doesn't matter. It's like, you're out there for the experience. They always have them for the experience. I think I always tell myself, and it used to be like, it was large part why I quit drinking is uh, I would be hung over and grumpy in the mornings a lot. And I would always have this feeling of like, man, your kids, didn't, they don't ask you to be born. Like they don't ask you to have them. So as much as they're annoying, I didn't want to do something that made me more annoyed by them in the morning and like when you're hung over and they're like waking you up and you're like oh my god i wish i didn't have this kid it's like they didn't come to you and they didn't like come to you and say like please have me and make me live in your house like you did that like that was a decision you made. whether you made the decision or not your actions resulted in that um i like the books of cormac mccarthy and there's a very stark morality in Cormac McCarthy's thing. Like, the, like evil is not punished in Cormac McCarthy. What's punished in Cormac McCarthy's books, if you look at them carefully, what's punished is people that do something and then they try to act or live as though they didn't do that. Cormac McCarthy hates that. So I don't, you know, you, if you have kids, you did that. It's a thing you did. Um, you got to own up. You have to own up. Nothing happened to you. Like, you're not a victim of anything. It's like, you did this. Now, like, man up. Or woman up. And <laughs> take them to do fun stuff that's going to teach them things. <laughs> um, Jake from Arlington, Texas, asks, is there a single profound moment from your youth that you can remember that led you down the path of being an outdoorsman and a conservationist? From my youth, no. Um, I was brought up around it to so much that it's like I just don't remember things. Th this story is going to almost sound like it's like, it's almost going to sound a little creepy, but it's not. Trust me, it's going to sound creepy, but I don't think of it as creepy. Do you sh are you sure you should tell it if it's going to? Okay, sound let me ask you this: At what age your kids like? At what age your kids stop jumping in the shower with like? At what age your boys stop okay. jumping in the shower with their dad? I think it probably varies for kids, but maybe around like five or six. Okay. I maybe, remember. I don't know. Did that just sound, <laughs> maybe we sound really Dude, cool. whatever age it is. I don't know. But like, it's a thing. It's real. It's real. Like our little boy, he doesn't do it as much anymore. No. When my kid, when, when like my littlest right. boy was like three or four years old, dude, Every time he got in the shower, all of a sudden there he is. You know, he just like he likes to come in there with his toys and play in the shower. Either way, I remember catching a largemouth bass off the neighbor's dock, and we used to uh, like sort of pre-fish. This is like so bad. This part's not the creepy part. We had a live well, so when bass season was coming, for whatever reason, we'd all fish bass and throw bass in the live well, and sort of like. Then on opening day, you'd clean the bass. It was like you hadn't really caught them. It was very illegal, like, but we didn't, I didn't think about it like that. And it would just be that if it wasn't seasoned, you caught a bass and threw it in the live well. And then on opening day, you cleaned them. It's not illegal. No, they, no it's totally on the, but, but you know, I was as young as what I'm going to explain. Yeah. I caught a bass and was trying to get it over to the live well and it slipped out of my hand and got away. And I remember crying about it in the shower with my dad. I was little. <laughs> I was as little as whatever that is. So I was just brought up around it. Uh, we did all the other stuff. Like we went to Disneyland, right? We did all the other stuff. We hunted and fished a lot from the beginning. If I was going to, I didn't have any sort of conservation epiphany until I was in my uh, drinking age. Right around when you start going to bars, 20, 21 years old. Um, and I discovered Aldo Leopold's San County Almanac. And I can tell you how I discovered it, but it's a long story. But I never thought about like conservation. Conservation was not a word that was bandied about when I was a kid. I was a member of Michigan United Conservation Clubs, but only because you couldn't sell fur at the Ravana Fur Auction without joining Michigan Trappers Association. 
And once you joined Michigan Travers Association, you were de facto a member of Michigan United Conservation Clubs. That would have been the only way I ever knew the word conservation, but we just called it MUCC. So I probably didn't even know what the hell the C stood for. Not a thing we talked about. I, that was that came later. This is somewhat related. Jacob from Nagani, Michigan, and I feel dumb for not knowing where Nagani is. I don't know where that town is. Might, might be a small both, town. Both of us are. Maybe he doesn't from know where Michigan. my town is. Um, Jacob wants to know why didn't you go into a conservationist field like your two older brothers? I have wondered a similar question about my little brother having two older brothers. He just had to be different. Uh, you know, I don't, the, the couple things I'll say about that, I don't think that I'm not because with my position, I'm able to put an incredible emphasis on conservation and I'm able to raise a lot of money for conservation organizations and I'm on the board of a conservation organization. So I focus a lot of my time and energy there. Um, so I do feel like I'm involved in the conservation world fairly aggressively um i know it sounds like a dickish thing to say but i just like like i feel like i like i i feel like i'm in there in terms of going into a conservation field like ecology or biology i was writing you know my brothers the two brothers i was brought up with they did phds we all entered the professional space right around the same time because it takes so damn long <clears throat> to go to get through all that school. So um, I was just starting to write professionally right around the same time they were starting to do what they did. But and I kind of felt like we were in my mind, we were all kind of going into what we thought we were going to go into, which is like outdoor fields. It never felt like a one or the other. Um, they were really strong in math and science. I was very weak in math and science. As a student, I was very strong in writing. I was very strong in history. Uh, struggled mightily in math. I was probably from an early age very intimidated. Or once I started to put together like the education, formal education, I was pretty intimidated by anything. Um, Especially like you go into those fields like ecology and biology, you're gonna do biochemistry. Um, I could do it now because my brain's changed a lot, but at that age, I wasn't gonna get through biochem anyway. Um, sucked at math. I still suck at. I still suck at math. Uh, I think that it was. It wasn't like I had this whole like smorgasbord of options laid out in front of me professionally. And I was going to just like pick one. And I was like, oh, well, my brother's doing that. Maybe I'll pick this. It was, I was by a lot of factors, I was like sent down a path. Um, I was inspired and sent down a path by like, I don't want to say by a higher power, but it sure, helped, sure as hell felt like a higher power sending me down a path. So I, and I, I never chose anything. I was going to be a trapper. But fur prices suck so bad. Then the next thing I knew is I was going to be a writer, and I had to work my ass off to be a writer. I never considered a different job. Um, I did see a question about whether or not Meat Eater was going to do a trapping series. Just as you're talking about trapping, I want to find the person who asked, but maybe you can answer. Yeah, we time. we know we've done trapping in the past. We did some more trapping material that we'll put out closer to trapping season. I think that it'd be pretty fun to do a trapping series and um, we've talked about it and yeah, I would, yeah, we will. We definitely will. That question was from AJ in Burlington, Wisconsin. There you go, AJ. We'll do it. We've, we've done more. We have a, not a, we have a, you know, it's funny because in our company, we have a million former fishing guides. We only have a few former trappers. I mean, we're like way overrepresented if you look at sort of like national demographics, but um, we have a few, only a couple of us were ever like real serious about it. Me and Seth, the Flip Flop Flesher, but we'll, we'll continue to do material on that for sure. Or not continue to do some, can do like, we'll continue to do some and, and amp it up and do more. 
Before we get back to kids, Clinton uh, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania wants to know why you always make that face when you're looking up a mountain. It's the way my face is. Uh, I don't know. I think I'm like kind of squinting, maybe. Like, like, like the sky's bugging me. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just blown away by mountains. It's a great question. Um, I'd never, you know, like some people that have the DTV will have like a catchphrase, you know? Like, Is that face your catchphrase? Like phrase? BBD, or I don't know, what's a couple more catchphrases? What's BBD? Shazam, like Big Buck Down. Oh. Shazam, who, what's Emerald say? Um, uh, you bam, no, bam. Whatever, whatever the hell he says. Yeah. We've always joked about how we should have a catchphrase, and maybe my catchphrase is just looking at a mountain. <laughs> but I've had people at live events ask me to do it. I'm like, I can't do it. Like, I don't know. You have to have a mountain. Or you have to have something to look up at. Um, okay. John from Arbuckle, California says, what's the one outdoor skill that you can pass down to your kids that would make you feel like an accomplished parent? Hmm. I have an answer for that. What is it? Patience and perseverance and... Oh. My wife says patience and perseverance, which is legit. I think, like, to go out and kill something and then make it and cook it for the family, you know, I, I guess you could get into sort of, like, attributes, you know? There's attributes. Patience, perseverance, self-sufficiency, just, like, these, like, high-minded attributes. But, like, a, like if we're talking about, like, a like a skill um the reason i'd say like kill something cook it for your family because think about how broad that is right like how do you go find the thing then you got to get it and you got to know how to clean it and you got to know how to cook it so it's a, it's it captures a lot if i said like wing shooting um i'd be like oh that's cool my kid's good at wing shooting but i wouldn't it wouldn't make me you feel good as a parent one. you have to choose one thing kill and cook Kill cook. Kill cook. That's, that's one thing. One word. Okay. Um, Chris from Pleasant Hill, Missouri wants to know, what was your favorite adventure with your dad and have you recreated it with your kids? Oh, I don't know, man. Yeah, a little bit to some degree. And in fact, I did it today. When I was a kid, you didn't have to go to school on your birthday. Like you'd always go fishing with dad. I mean, he'd take us fishing a lot, but you could play hooky on your birthday. And my birthday's in mid-February, so we'd, we'd ice fish on my birthday. And we don't do it, but maybe I, we don't do it, like, real consciously. But maybe I should start doing that. It's just like there, it's like calendars get filled up. And there's three days where you're, you know, trying to do stuff. And they're in school, and they get in trouble for not going to school. But that was one of the best things. But, no, my dad was not. He, he would say this. He would say, I'm not here to be your friend. And he really lived up to that. Uh, he was not there to be your friend. I, I don't really have that kind of memory of my dad. <clears throat> we didn't have him until he was diagnosed uh, that he had six months to live. Then we started getting along good. That really kind of like knocked his dick in the dirt, you know. We started getting along good. But prior to that, uh, that like took all the fight out of him. Then we got along. Prior to that, he was tough. He was tough. He was tough. I love him. I understand why he did what he did. Um, I understand that he was operating in a different world than I was. He had a completely different upbringing. He had no role model. Um, he got messed up in the war. On and on and on. He had a kid die in a motorcycle crash right when I was born. Like He was basically abandoned by his parents, raised by his grandparents. Um, but yeah, uh, I understand where he was coming from. He was dealt a shitty hand. We didn't get along that great, but he taught me a lot of really, really valuable stuff. And I wouldn't be who I am without him. Um, Sean from Wasilla, Alaska wants to know as meat, as the meat eater kids come of age, is there any plans on making any hunting fishing episodes with them? No. No, not till they get like quite a bit older. I don't know. We haven't decided what age. Uh, we had to make some rules for ourselves early on. And, and rather than about like what level of exposure we wanted to give our kids to, to, to media. I don't mean like what they watch, though we do monitor that to some extent. 
um but we much more tightly monitor the ways in which like they're put out in media um we don't you you know we're we're pretty we keep them pretty buttoned up um in terms of showing like and doing public facing things with them if you ever look at my instagram uh i'll have my kids sometime in there but you never see their face right and, and it's like it might seem a little arbitrary like well why not show them at all if you're not gonna show their face it was just that we made rather than have rather than taking everything as case by case we just made like a rule our rule is and it winds up being a pretty perfect rule because it's just it's very clean and, and sort of hits all the marks we don't put their faces okay we don't put their faces on social we don't put their faces on tv either. we don't put their faces on anything so that rule um someday we'll abandon it right for now it sticks it's just the rule it just rules out any kind of video tv video just rules it out i would say where i'm sitting right now i think that they would need to be 18 before i trusted them to know what they were getting into um at that age, if they decided that's what they wanted to partake in, I feel that they'd be making the decision and I wouldn't be making the decision for them. Uh, that might change. But Jimmy was on the Meat Eater podcast today. Not his face. No, his face wasn't. But what? explain why you think that's different. Because it didn't violate the rule we made. Hmm. We had to make a rule. If not, if we didn't have a rule, then we'd, be de we'd have a debate every day. Every day, be like, well, what if he does this? Well, I don't know. It's just like no face. It's it's it's. We didn't even realize how perfect the rule was. It's just like very simple. I I mean, I love the rule. I think you made I, the rule. I, I did make the rule. Yeah, so it's I, just like, that's why I love it. It's a great rule um, for us. I'm not condemning anyone. I asked a friend one time, like, who you puts his kids on stuff all the time, and I was like, man, are you worried about putting your kid on everything? Like, I feel like you're kind of like making their path for them in a way where you're making like that they have this very strong digital. They have a digital footprint that'll never go away. When my kid did a cameo on our podcast, I joked with him during the podcast. I explained, you understand that this is your first digital footprint. Like what you say right now, once we publish it, will always it'll always exist. It'll always exist. You're making your first stamp, right? You're making an indelible cave painting right now that'll live with you the rest of your life. Um the hell was I getting at? Oh, and we were talking about my buddy puts his kids on stuff all the time. He's like, it's our family business. It's how I make a living. If I was a dairy farmer and I made my kids milk cows, would you be coming to me about how it's mean that my kids milk cows? And I said, not a, even a little bit. I totally, totally understand. As you'll know, if you're a parent, um, every family's got to do what works for them. I, I like. There's a lot of ways to skin uh, cats. So I think we have time for one more question. Okay, one more. Um, and if this isn't the one you want to end on, you can just let me know that. But Martin from Grand Junction, Colorado, wants to know, what's your favorite campfire tale to share while camping? I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I'm going to tell about the story. Uh, well, you can't you can't do the thing where you like don't tell a joke, but you tell about the joke because it kind of ruins the joke. Yeah, what she's talking about is sometimes... Um, if, if there's a joke that you can't, you shouldn't tell because of evolving tastes and sensibilities culturally, I will now and then tell about the joke where I'm like, I'm not telling you the joke, but I'm just making you aware that there's a joke that goes like this. And I'm not telling, I would never tell this joke, but I'm just telling you about this joke that exists. So you know that what's out there. This is a little bit different than that. I'm not going to tell the story in an animated fashion that I normally would, but I'll tell a bit of it. I was hunting doll sheep with my brothers. And my my brother Danny lives in Alaska, so I don't need a guide to hunt sheep as long as he's there. Because if you live in Alaska, like your second degree kindred can hunt with you. So I can have a sheep tag and hunt sheep with him without a guide. It's great. It's a great rule. Love it. At the last minute, one of my brothers brought his girlfriend along. And one night, in the middle of the night, I hear a, a witch, as best I can tell. I mean, we're like so far, 
We hiked nine miles up a river and were camped at the foot of a glacier. And glaciers make their own weather. Like they're cooling the air, right? So you could be in a place where there's zero wind. And you go down at the foot of a glacier and there's howling wind because all that cooling air is just rushing down valley. So it's already windy as shit. And I hear, right? And you're like, oh, is that the wind? And I wake Danny up. We're sharing tent. I wake Danny up. I'm like, there's like a woman out screaming in the night, you know? And it's freaking us out. And we yell over and wake our other brother up. And he sits up, right? He's like, what the? You know? Woo! He's like, oh my God, what is it? What is it? What's happening? His girlfriend's name's Sarah. All of a sudden he's like, holy shit, Sarah. She had gone down uh, to get a drink of water and lost which traction the river was in and got lost bad out in the dark. Oh my God, that was scary. But when I really tell the story, I, I, can, I can do a pretty good job of telling the story. <laughs> I like to tell that story. It's a good, scary story. What do you want to you want to wrap up and final thoughts on outdoor kids raising outdoor kids? I hope you enjoy it. What I should have done, I should have closed with my stuff about Cormac McCarthy, um, and uh, trying to live the perils of trying to live a life where you act like something didn't happen that happened. Um, whether you, you know, anyone in your life who has kids, who's blessed to have kids around, whether it's a, you're a parent, you're an aunt or uncle, you're a babysitter, your grandma or grandpa, you're a neighbor, whatever. Um, they're great. They take a lot of energy, but it's it's like one of the most valuable things that can happen with you. It just gives you, it lets you look at the world in such a refreshing way. Um, and they're the people who are going to be running the planet, you know? They're the people who are going to be making big decisions. Um, I'm not going to sit and say it's not hard. It's so hard, especially if you grew up in the outdoors, it's hard to reckon with the thing that like a lot just changed when you have kids. Um, your freedom depletes, right? Your autonomy depletes. It can, it can turn, I've seen it turn people bitter. Um, but just dig in and like make it that, that this is a thing you're going to do. You're going to, you're going to experience nature with these kids. Um, and all the time you're sometimes all the time you're doing it, it's hard. Sometimes all the time you're doing it, it's not fun. But it's the kind of thing where you always look back and you never ever regret it. You never regret it. I've explained a lot that I've taken a lot of I've taken many, many, many people, dozens of people on their first hunting trips or fishing trips. Only a very small fraction of them make it adopt the discipline for themselves. Only a very small fraction become actual, what I would call like actual hunters and anglers. I have never had a person, I've never had a single person regret doing it. Everyone's been glad they did it. When you take your kids out into the outdoors and you take kids into nature and, and give them that relationship with the natural world, and then you look back on it, you will never regret doing it. You'll never be like, I wish I hadn't taken that kid out fishing. You, it just doesn't happen. It might be hard. It might suck while you're doing it. It's always rewarding. And I think that it's so much more important in life to chase things that you're going to feel good about after the fact rather than chasing things that you're going to regret after the fact. Remember what I said about not drinking anymore. Like, Chase things that you're so glad you did it. Not that like, oh, I wish I would have done that. Um, and, you're, and, and, and when you do that with kids outdoors, it's like you're chasing a thing you'll be glad you did. You'll look back on it. So read the book. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I hope it gives you a pathway toward having a more fulfilled life. And I hope that it, by extension, improves the lives of, of kids out there. Uh, they, need to be, they need to be paid attention to. I'm going to close with one thought. That was already closed. I'm gonna close another thought. I have a, a guy I'm 
friends with. We don't talk that much. But he worked in family law. So divorce stuff and courts and kids that were getting like sent away, you know, to, to jail or whatever, right? Uh, he, he worked in that whole arena. Families breaking up. And we were talking about things that mess kids up. You know, like, oh, what if it messes my kid up if he sees a deer die? Or He's like, I'll tell you the one thing that messes kids up, and it works every time. It's when they know that no one gives a shit about them. That's what messes kids up. That's the thing that messes kids up. So don't leave that in your wake, right? Um, and enjoy enjoy the book. And I hope you find a pathway to success there. So thank you very much for joining. Really appreciate everybody that stuck around. Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.